Sublimation. Oh, yes. Well, Freud regarded this as a real driving force in culture per se. So the quote here is, okay, then I'll sculpt naked women. So Freud believed that instinctual motivations like sexuality that weren't finding their expression in the logical behavioral conclusion could be, the energy could be channeled, so to speak, into other sorts of pursuits. And the sublimation explanation is a really interesting one from an evolutionary, evolutionary psychology perspective because you see these weird things happening not only in human beings but also in animals. There's this animal bird called a bower bird. You could look them up. Bower is B-O-W-E-R. They're really cool birds. And so the males make this, they go on the ground and then they sweep the ground with their wings and then they build this really complicated weaved thing that's nest-like and then they make little art pictures in front of it. So they take like red leaves and they put them all in a pile and then they go find some yellow leaves and they put them in a pile and maybe a few rocks and some seeds and some bottle caps and they make this really beautiful display. And they, you know, there's a bunch of them in one area that do that and then the females come along and they look at the artistic display and they look at the little bird and they look at the artistic display and maybe they're happy and move in or maybe they hop off to find some other bower birds little artistic production. And they're really nice, like these are major league efforts, especially given that birds make them. And uh, <laughs> if the bower bird gets visited by three or four females and, uh, you know, the whole artistic thing isn't going very well, then they erase the little thing they've done with their with their wings and they tear apart the little thing they've woven and then they're all depressed and then they start again. And so, and that's a good example of this complex idea called sublimation because obviously the bird is utilizing its creative capacity to fill a sexual, in, to fulfill a sexual instinct. Now Freud would say the sexual instinct is being channeled into the creative production and it's actually relatively hard to make a case against that if you're a Darwinian. And we know, for example, that one of the things that makes human beings attractive to one another is creativity, you know, manifested, say, in dress and all sorts of other things. And so, you know, the question is, is sexuality driving that at the individual level, which would be a Freudian interpretation, or is it tangled up in it even more deeply at a biological level, in that the whole reason that people are creative is so that we're attractive to one another. And so, and that drives the species and it drives reproduction and so, our creative endeavor is somehow tangled up deeply with our, with our reproductive desire. And it's certainly not an unreasonable proposition. Projection. So you're arguing with someone. Well, you, do, you guys do this all the time. You're making me mad. It's like, you think about that, that's a really interesting statement. It's like, well, you know it's true in a way, right? Because now you're, you're arguing with someone who's really annoying. And clearly they're making you mad. On the other hand, the only reason they're making you mad is because you're accepting the, you know, the structure within which the argument is occurring. And the fact that they're able to elicit that sort of response from you means that your interpretation of the circumstance plays a causal role. So that's a complex form of projection. A simpler form of projection is... Well, you just don't think about it at all. It's like, you're not touchy, the other person's annoying. And a lot of arguments are actually about settling that. You're touchy. No, you're annoying. No, you're touchy. No, you're annoying. It's like, how do you ever settle that? Well, usually you start dishing out even larger insults, you know. Not only are you annoying, but you annoy lots of other people, not just me. You know, and that's... It's a funny kind of projection because... It obviously isn't, it often isn't precisely clear who started what or who is, in fact, at fault. Anyways, that's not a comprehensive listing of Freudian defense mechanisms, but it's not a bad one. Unconscious ideas are at the core of psychological conflicts. I can give you an example. Let's do a psychosomatic one. This sort of thing is extremely complicated. So I had a client once who, she had a real fun time. I'll change the story a little bit. Um, she was at a job that she had been training at for a long period of time, and she thought she was doing pretty well, but they fired her 
And then they packed her up and put her on her bicycle to go home the same day. And then on the way home, she drove her bicycle down a ravine and, and you know, crashed into a tree. So that's real fun. That's a one-two punch, right? So first of all, your job disappears. And then as you're just barely not recovering from that, then bang, you get hurt. And she was quite hurt as a consequence of the accident. So she had come to see me for was looked like post-traumatic stress disorder, but there was a bit of a, there was a bit of underlying thought disorder that was sort of, sort of associated with it. But to make a long story short, one of the things that she did when she came to see me was she was always like this. And um, I found this very bothersome after a while because of mirror, I think it was mirroring. So she'd come in here like this and that would make me uncomfortable. And one day I had, I had mentioned this to her and she said she was, she thought she had hurt her arm and maybe she had. And so I started getting her to move her arm a little bit, so she'd move it like this, and then she'd move it like this, and then she'd move it like this. And she was getting so she could move it pretty well. And then the next time she came in, she was still like this, and I got this weird impulse, and I said, well, come over, just stand. I'd seen her for like years by this point. I said, just stand by my desk. And so she stood like this, and I sort of pounded my fist down her spine. And uh, she cried for like 45 minutes. So that was pretty interesting. I mean, it was light, <laughs> light, light pounding, eh? And then her shoulder was looser and she could move her arm more. And so then I kind of investigated that. And she said, well, she was afraid to move her arm because she might damage it more. And so then I looked into that. And then she told me a story about how one time when she was five years old, she'd gone accidentally into a wagon and gone down a hill and, and cracked up at the bottom. And then they put her in the hospital. And then her parents weren't allowed to see her for like a month and a half, which is what hospitals used to do, because they were sadistic and stupid. And so that left her with a permanent distrust of institutions, which was sort of associated with the kind of the paranoid edge of her post-traumatic stress disorder, but also accounted for why she didn't want to move her arm, because she thought if she moved it, then that might hurt her more, and then she'd end up in the hospital. And so that's a good example of how unconscious memories and conflicts, part of the big conflict there for her was she had a real problem with institutions, you know, and a lot of that was politicized. There was something wrong with all institutions, which is true, but irrelevant in most cases, you know, because you still have to adapt to the damn things. But it had really hurt her adaptation because she couldn't trust institutions, and then if she ever got hurt physically, she couldn't move herself because she was afraid she'd re-damage the body part and then she'd end up in an institution. So that's a good example. Um, incomprehensible distress. 